heavens are like grasshoppers. Who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spread them like a tent to live in. Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither. And the tempest carries them off like stone. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not heard? Have you not known? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He is understanding, is un his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary. The young will fall exhausted, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Our New Testament lesson comes from Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up, and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Tori Parker, young adult advisory delegate, or YAD, from the Presbyterian of West Virginia, asking recognition to give my report on my time at the 220th General Assembly in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> I honestly cannot tell you how many times I've heard variations on that phrase this week. Mumble or screamed Korean accent or Minnesotan accent, 18-year-olds to 81-year-olds. I found throughout my time at General Assembly that obedience to Robert's Rules of Order concerning Parliamentary Procedure, or Parley Pro, as we as affectionately called it, is one of the few things that every single Presbyterian of the Assembly has in common, alongside an inherent mistrust of every committee besides his or her own and a raging caffeine addiction. <laughs> I'm supposed to fill you all in on the goings on at the 220th General Assembly, but I have to admit that I'm having a little trouble doing so, seeing as that an average day at GA for a YAD starts at 7.30 a.m. and is planned to the second until it ends around 12.30 to 1 a.m. It is a virtual marathon of Presbyterian governance and fellowship. My first full day, Friday, was spent only with the other yads as we were locked in the ballroom floor of the Wyndham Hotel and forced to bond as we were given a 12-hour rundown on what our job was and how we were to go about doing it. This included a lengthy introduction to parliamentary procedure, which, as anyone ever subject to it knows, is one of the more cruel, necessary evils of the world. <laughs> At the end of that day, we were all exhausted from what we thought had been a long, stressful day of absorbing too much information and being 
bind to the same seat for far too long. What fools we were to think that that had been a long day. <laughs> Saturday is a big day at General Assembly because it is the official opening day and because it contains the election of the moderator. The worship service, if you've ever had the chance to go to a General Assembly, is a sight to behold. Over 3,000 people from across the country come together to celebrate the presence of God in this gathering of our denomination. I was honored to walk the Presbytery of West Virginia banner down the center aisle during the procession of banners, something I have been told by Forrest Palmer was a tradition for the yeah from a Presbytery to do. It turns out that West Virginia is the only Presbytery that still abides by this tradition, so I was the only yeah there, not that I'm here. However, I neither dropped it nor fell, and in doing so, I pray that I represented us well. That night, we elected Neil Pressa as our moderator for the 220th General Assembly, and he was commissioned by the moderator of the 219th General Assembly, the beloved Cynthia Volbeck, who is still fighting cancer in need of your prayers. Neil Pressa is a young liturgical theologian and a teaching elder from Middlesex, New Jersey, who is of Filipino descent and who is very popular with the yeah. Due to his constant effort to ensure that our voice is heard and his willingness to party with us at our late night yet gatherings. <laughs> Neil is an excellent moderator. He is charismatic, a non anxious presence, and is well versed in General Assembly procedure. Although I'll admit I only voted for him once out of the four times it took us to get him the 50% of the vote that it takes to win, I think he did and will do a marvelous job as moderator. For worship on Sunday, we were given a list of churches in the area and told to pick one when we registered for the assembly online. I chose a church called Westminster, mainly because the name sounded familiar. And two, because the Hot Metal Bridge Presbyterian Church, its real name, was regrettably fully booked. So I dragged my poor roommate Sarah along with me to walk the seven blocks to catch the 8.45 a.m. bus to Westminster where we attended two worship services, the contemporary worship service in the gym and the traditional worship service in the sanctuary, and received communion twice. And I discovered that aside from the fact that their membership roles hold about a thousand more people than ours, and they use pita bread for their communion, it really wasn't that different from home, which is something I've always loved and hated about the Presbyterian Church, decently and in order from coast to coast. <laughs> On Monday, we got down to business. I served on the Committee for Church Orders and Ministry. At first glance, this may sound like a boring or easy committee to serve on, but let me assure you that is not the case. The hot button issue attached to my committee was the consideration to reinstate the language extracted by the last General Assembly concerning ordination standards, an issue that caused great division and turmoil within the denomination and even caused some churches to feel as though they had no choice but to leave, including four from our own presbytery. We struggled a great deal in my committee over whether or not the fear of losing congregations was worth sacrificing what we thought was morally right. Something that resonated with our committee and was echoed frequently within it was a remark made by moderator candidate Sue Crumble, who was the one I did vote for. When asked what the church should do if and when it was faced with the reality that some churches felt they needed to leave the denomination, she replied that we must define ourselves and that if some churches do not feel comfortable with that definition, that is okay. It does not make them bad Christians, she said, and I believe her to be correct. It simply means that they do not wish to be a part of this denomination as we have defined it. My committee recommended another item to deal with this division. The language of the current ordination standards was passed because it was that of inclusion, of welcoming those to ministry previously banned from it due to a certain interpretation of scripture. But we as the PCUSA now recognize that we cannot and do not have one single interpretation of scripture and will not subject the body to one single interpretation of scripture on any matter. It is an action taken so that we consistently work for unity above uniformity, actions like which we as a denomination should be taking more of. On our first day of plenary, which is the large meeting of the full body, before we had even elected a new moderator, we were given a presentation to show us the breakdown of the population of our church and of our General Assembly commissioners. It should be no surprise 
surprise to anyone that our church as a whole is aging. The ratio between under 25 year olds to over 65 year olds is approximately one to six. Over 66% of the commissioners there were over the age of 55. The median age of a member of a PCUSA church is 60. Two thirds of our ministers are over 50. We are also a 94% white denomination and two thirds of our ministers are male. But despite all of these similarities, we are a church divided. On every major controversial issue brought before the assembly, the end results show that almost equal representation on either side of the vote. But we are also a smart denomination. The smartest, in fact, as over 60% of our members have been blessed with a college education. We know in our hearts that differences do not have to mean division. That what, is, that what unites us, a love of Christ and a deep commitment to furthering his ministry through the church, is stronger than what polarizes us. But these divisions exhaust us, mentally, financially, and after 17 hours of plenary hearings in one day, let me tell you that they do indeed exhaust us physically. However, we look to Isaiah, who tells us that those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. And that is what it comes down to. At the worship service on Thursday, we heard from a young pastor named James King, who served as a little church on the prairie in Lakewood, Washington. He spoke about the story of the paralyzed man, who was lowered down through the roof and healed by Jesus. He drew our attention to the fact that Christ first forgave the man of his sins, and then healed his paralysis. Forgiveness, he said, leads to healing. What I took away from this message to us was that we as a people of the same church must forgive each other our differences, must forgive each other for being human, for having different interpretations of scripture, and for hearing God's call different ways. We must forgive each other these things before we begin healing the wounds of our divisions, so that as a whole church, as the Presbyterian Church, USA, United, not uniform, we may trust in the Lord and renew our strength.